listeners, happy Saturday. Today, we are sharing our 2012 podcast on Alan Turing. And this one comes from past hosts, Sarah and Dublina. We also have an update to this episode. In 2013, Alan Turing was granted a royal pardon for his 1952 conviction for gross indecency. That pardon came into effect on December 24th, 2013. And while this posthumous pardon was generally praised, it was also criticized because thousands of other men had faced similar convictions. But when Alan Turing was pardoned, they were not. However, a law nicknamed the Alan Turing Law received royal assent in 2016, and that paved the way to pardon men, primarily gay and bisexual men, who had been convicted of these types of crimes under laws that have since been abolished. And a mass pardon followed in January of 2017. It did include other previous podcasts, subject Oscar Wilde, At that point, about 15,000 of the 65,000 men who had been convicted under these now-repealed laws were actually still living. So listen in for Alan Turing. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And today we're going to be talking about Alan Turing. And he's considered the father of computer science, the father of artificial intelligence, and also one of the most important wartime code breakers in World War II. So quite a resume just right off the bat there. And for listeners with a more literary bent, he's also been called the Shelley of science, which is a a name I, I kind of took a shine to. Yeah, and others have too. He's been a really popular podcast suggestion, though his resume's focus on math and technology has always kind of scared us off a little bit, I think. I mean, things like number theory, probability, computer programs, yeah, stuff, not our usual subject matter. Stuff I'm, I'm honestly a little scared to get into too deeply. But fortunately, some of his work really transcends the arcane. It's it's understandable if you put some effort into it. And there's a wealth of biographical materials too, which I feel like the last few podcasts I've done, that has not been the case. So it was a little It was a little refreshing, really, to research Alan Turing and know that there's so much out there about this man. There are MIT lectures. There's a digital archive at alanturing.net. There are articles in just about every science journal you can name. And there's a How Stuff Works podcast, too. Yeah, Jonathan and Chris talked about Turing's life last fall on Tech Stuff. And so that's a great place to turn if you want a a little more of an in-depth discussion on programming specifically. I I was glad, though, um, that even they admitted that the math was kind of tricky to discuss. It's just so high level. But they do really do a good job covering the programming and, and that side of Turing story. But it's also June, which is Pride Month, and that's why we've picked Turing for today's topic. He's a great, if tragic, example of a remarkable man, really a genius, whose life was so clearly defined by his homosexuality and reminded me a lot of Oscar Wilde, who Katie and I covered last year for Pride Month. He was another man who was really destroyed by prejudice at the absolute height of his achievement. So it's a great story to learn about, and it's it's good to know about Turing's achievements, but it is also a really, really sad story. Yeah, it is. But before we get to that, we're going to start sort of with the beginnings of his life. Alan Matheson Turing was born June 23rd, 1912 in London to a member of the Indian Civil Service. His father actually served in the Madras presidency, and his mother's father was the chief engineer of the Madras railways. But Turing didn't grow up in India. Instead, his parents had the kids fostered in British homes, which, as you can imagine, was pretty lonely and and his parents didn't even come back to England until 1926. Yeah, not until his dad retired. So he spent prep school trying to do as much science and math as he could get away with, which at the time, it wasn't really the agenda. He, I guess he would be an outstanding student these days. But his skepticism and his curiosity also sometimes got him in trouble with with the authority figures at school. But in 1928, he had his first experience of 
true intellectual stimulation. He made friends with a boy who was one year ahead of him, uh, Christopher Morcom. And Jonathan and Chris, the way they explain this, I, I really liked it, the way they explain the friendship. Essentially, the two kids could bounce ideas off of each other and combine what they knew and really come away from it with a deeper understanding. So sort of a, a friendship of, of two minds that was really influential in the young Turing's life. Yeah, so when Morcom died suddenly in 1930, teenage Turing was left wondering what happened to Morcom's consciousness. He was pretty devastated and, and wanted to explore that idea further. So for three years, he wrote letters to Morcom's mother trying to figure out the relationship between mind and matter. And that's a quest that would later define his work in artificial intelligence, which we're going to talk about a little more in a few minutes. Yeah, we'll definitely be talking about that. But in October 1931, so while he's really in the middle of his grief and, and this new look into the relationship between mind and matter. He goes off to college, King's College, Cambridge, and of course, he studies math. And it was really a different, inspiring environment for him, too, one where he could think creatively, he could study things like philosophy and economics and surround himself by intelligent people and also recognize his own sexuality. And he socialized with some of the anti-war intellectual circle, but his politics weren't really sharply defined during this period. His main recreation was athletic. He liked running and rowing and sailing and, of course, doing math. Yeah. By 1934, he had received a distinguished degree. And by 1935, at age 22, he got a fellowship to King's College. So well on this intellectual path of his. But it was in 1935 that Turing started tackling an intriguing mathematical question, and that's the question of decidability. And during that process, he envisions a machine that could complete computational operations just like the human brain. The Turing machine at that point was purely theoretical, but it could perform any kind of operation it was programmed to do, play chess, calculate numbers, anything like that. And that idea develops into the idea of a universal Turing machine, which could handle any task an individual Turing machine could. So, for example, if the Turing machine is the early computer program, the universal machine would be the early computer, the one machine that can do any task it's programmed to do. Yeah, and a guy named B. Jack Copeland described the significance of this creation in an MIT lecture, and it really helped me understand how important it was because it might seem a little old hat. If you, if you just look at it like a computer or a computer program. He said, nowadays when nearly everyone owns the physical realization of a universal Turing machine, Turing's idea of a one-stop shop computing machine is apt to seem as obvious as the wheel. But in 1936, engineers thought in terms of building specific machines for particular purposes. So this was really a revolutionary idea at the time. And of course, some people realized that, but not everyone knew the full implications of, of what this idea would eventually come to. Yeah, and it would be more than a decade before the physical realization of a Turing machine was actually built. Until then, Turing continu continued his studies at Princeton and then returned to England and Cambridge before the outbreak of World War II. And then on the first full day of the war, he joined the Government Code and Cipher School, whose headquarters were at the now-famous Bletchley Park in London. Yeah, and the GCCS was busy bringing together all of the country's top minds at this point. So mathematicians like Turing, but also chess players and Egyptologists, all sorts of, of smart people with different kinds of skills, anyone who they hoped might lend insight into breaking German codes, which was what they were all about. And the chief code at the time, the one that was really giving them the most trouble, was the Enigma. And Polish cryptanalysis had been working on the Enigma for a really long time, since 1932, and they had created a code-breaking machine called the Bomba a few years after that. But by 1939, Turing and others were helping to create a new machine, one that could adapt to the Enigma because it got to where the Germans were changing the codes every 24 hours, pretty much. So he helped develop a new machine called the Bomb, which could decipher Luftwaffe Enigma communications. There's a really neat British Heritage article by Jean Paschke about Bletchley Park, which I recommend if you just sort of want to get a picture of it. We were actually talking about this might be a good episode in itself. but I hope we don't give too much away. In that case. <laughs> it nicely describes rooms full of these machines and the operators who maintain them. And in case you think that they're little 
tiny devices like we're used to today, little electronic devices. They are not in any sense like that. They are large mechanical machines that required a lot of upkeep. They had to be kept clean. Um, they were they took up the room essentially. So these really big machines, they helped crack the Air Force enigma, but the German naval enigma was kind of a tougher nut to crack and also critical for winning the Battle of the Atlantic. So Turing had worked out part of the code in 1939, but the big break in the situation came courtesy of the Royal Navy when they captured an enigma machine and code book from a U-boat. So by June 1941, U-boat traffic was decipherable. Yeah, they had cracked the code. And by early 1942, Bletchley Park was decoding 39,000 German transmissions a month. And of course, some of those were complaints about the underwear splitting down the middle (laughs) and that type of thing, but also some really serious communications in there. It rose to an eventual 84,000 transmissions a month. So pretty astonishing figure. And with the 1943 breaking of Germany's high-level binary teleprinter code, which was what Hitler himself used and and high members of his government, um, Churchill was able to read Hitler's mail before Hitler could read it, according to Poschke's article, something I, I thought was interesting and something I never knew about Bletchley Park. Yeah, me neither. But it turns out the combined efforts of Bletchley Park shortened the war by two years. And for his part, Turing received the Order of the British Empire, which was one of the most prestigious awards you could get. Yeah, and so after the war, he was looking for a new job, and he was recruited to the National Physics Laboratory. And the task, conveniently enough, was to design and build an electronic computer. So essentially, a real Turing machine seems like just the guy to bring in to do this. And he called his new design the Automatic Computing Engine, which has the lovely acronym ACE. (laughs) Would have made a good computer. Uh, And it was a really ambitious, advanced design. It, if it had been built, it would have had the memory capacity of an early Mac. So that's pretty astounding if you consider this immediately after World War II. Yeah, but things moved more slowly than they had at Bletchley Park. There was lots of red tape to deal with. And Turing's colleagues thought that the original ACE design was too much and opted for a smaller machine, which was called the Pilot Model ACE. So part of the problem here was that Turing's wartime achievements were unrecognized due to their secrecy. Yeah, he couldn't go out and say, well, guys, at Bletchley Park, I did this. I mean, he he couldn't talk about any of that stuff. Yeah, he couldn't brag on himself. So to relieve the frustration and the stress of the situation, he started long distance running. And it took an injury actually to prevent him from qualifying for the 1948 Olympic marathon team. So he was pretty good at it. Yeah, he was really good at it. It's, it's one of those I don't know. It's like a cherry on top for somebody with so many talents that they would also be an amazing athlete. Well, I was going to say it's almost not fair, but you're kinder than I am, obviously. (laughs) Yeah, well, whatever way you look at it. But by this point, delays meant that the National Physics Laboratory wasn't going to be the first place that built the first working electronic stored program digital computer. That honor went to Manchester University, and it happened in June 1948. So Turing, obviously frustrated by his his time at the National Physics Laboratory. Yeah, they got beat out. Yeah, they got beat out. He wasn't really listened to. His achievements and accomplishments weren't really appreciated to the the level they deserve to be. So he went to work in Manchester, oddly enough, as the deputy director, even though there was no director of the program. Kind of a strange little detail there. Yeah, but he designed the programming system of the Ferranti Mark I, the first commercially available digital electronic computer. So hopefully that was a little solace for him there. Consolation prize, yeah. Um, And it was also during his time at Manchester that Turing started to hypothesize about what would later be known as artificial intelligence. And and I thought it was it was interesting. And this is something that's kind of, I guess, difficult for me to talk about with my limited knowledge of computer programming and science. I just work on a computer. I don't <laughs> know what happens inside. But I was impressed that um, even though he had uh, 
He had the skill to work on developing this field. He put the machine to use right away. So I'm sure he was still considering about how it could be advanced, but he started looking for ways to use the Ferranti Mark I, which I thought was was pretty neat. Yeah, it kind of went back to his old interest in the connection between mind and matter. And in 1950, Turing wrote a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence in the Journal Mind. In it, he proposed something called an imitation test. Today, that's called the Turing test. And the test basically provided a way to judge the intelligence of a machine without bias. So an interrogator, for example, would sit in an isolated room from two subjects, one a person, one a machine, and the interrogator would ask them both questions. And if the interrogator couldn't tell who was who, then that meant the machine was thinking. Yeah, it it had intelligence in some definable way. And Turing even predicted, he had a lot of confidence in computers. He predicted that by the year 2000, a computer would be so good at this game, this this, uh, Turing test, an interrogator would not have more than a 70% chance of correctly identifying who is who after five minutes. And that is a very ambitious goal because according to Encyclopedia Britannica, no computer today has even come close to that standard. But Turing really, he, he did have a lot of hopes for computers. Yeah. He also hypothesized that one day Quote, ladies would take their computers for walks in the park and tell each other, my little computer said such a funny thing in the morning. (laughs) I think we're a little closer to that one than the 70% goal. Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I still like my doggy, though. Yeah. (laughs) So Turing continued to study artificial intelligence, but also stuff like biological growth with the Ferranti Mark I. I said that he, he really did put that machine to good use. And his career was expanding into these different subject areas, and his recognition was also growing. He was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of London in March 1951. That's another really prestigious honor. He was appointed to readership in the theory of computing at Manchester, which sounds like a very modern title. But in 1952, things took a turn for the worse in his life after a break-in in in his Manchester home. And he told the police that he thought the burglar was probably connected to a man he was, quote, having an affair with. And he had been pretty open about his sexuality since college. During his Bletchley Park days, he had proposed to a colleague, Joan Clark, but broke it off. He told her that he was gay and and couldn't marry her. But being so frank with the police in this way was really dangerous because at the time, homosexuality was a felony in Great Britain. And so Turing was tried and convicted of gross indecency, and he was faced with a really terrible choice. Yeah, his two choices were prison or hormone injections of estrogen. So chemical sterilization. Yeah, and he chose the latter and also lost his security clearance as a result. So no government codes, no government computers. And on June 7th, 1954, he was found dead by his housekeeper with a partially eaten cyanide-laced apple by his side. Now, some have theorized that he was assassinated as a security risk, but it's pretty much widely accepted nowadays that Turing committed suicide. And even then. Right. And it's also accepted that Turing did kill himself in in this particular way so that it would allow his mother to interpret the situation as an accident since he'd been working with cyanide and other chemicals in his work. Yeah, so she thought that he had some cyanide on his hands and he ate an apple and accidentally poisoned himself. But... uh, Assuming he did commit suicide, which is what most people assume, it's a really tragic end to to this great life and, and at the heels of this terrible prosecution. So in 2009, Prime Minister Gordon Brown issued a formal apology for the British government's treatment of Turing. And um, I'm going to read just part of it. He said, Turing truly was one of those individuals we can point to whose unique contribution helped to turn the tide of war. The debt of gratitude he's owed makes it all the more horrifying, therefore, that he was treated so inhumanely. On the behalf of the British government and all those who live freely, thanks to Alan's work, I'm very proud to say we're sorry. You deserve so much better. 
So 2012 is Alan Turing year, and stateside recognition has been longstanding. The U.S. Association for Computer Machinery has given out the Turing Award since 1966. And if anything, as technology develops and new areas of study emerge, Alan Turing will probably just become more recognized as the years go on. Yeah, if you think about how many career descriptions that apply to his name, you know, father of artificial intelligence, that sort of thing that didn't exist when he was alive. We can only imagine that more will be added over the years as science and technology advances. Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday Classic. Since this is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar during the course of the show, that may be obsolete now. So here is our current contact information. We are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com, and then we're at Missed in History all over social media. That is our name on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 